Hey everybody, David Shapiro here. So today we're going to talk about the transition from uh, from here to universal basic income and beyond. So basically, this question came from my Patreon audience, and uh, the 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 question was simple: like, how do we get from here to post labor economics? Like, how do we get from here to zero employment? Um, how do we get there? But also, what does that look like? What does that phase look like? And also, I wanted to address that. Uh, thank you for providing uh, feedback. You guys said very loud and clear that you want to make sure that you see my face, um, which I appreciate. Like, you know, I I'm the same way. I do watch some uh, faceless channels, some some uh, you know voiceover only channels. Um, you know, my good friend Philip over at AI Explained is a is a faceless channel. Um, but I understand that like you've made a connection with me, so. Uh, I just wanted to address that, and I would say I, I will be continuing to experiment because I do want to increase the quality of my production. Um, so I'll probably be popping in and out in terms of face right now. But I'm also, what I do want to say is that uh, it is much easier for me to focus on elocution if I'm just doing voiceover. So I'll probably do a hybrid approach. So let me know if this video is better. I'm also about to experiment with hiring a professional outsourced editing uh, studio. So the editing should improve, so on and so forth. That's beside the point, let's get on with the show. So for the sake of this video, I'm just gonna make a few assumptions, but I wanted to spell out those assumptions so that you knew what they were. Uh, first assumption is that the, con that the current arc of AI improvement will continue, um, at least for the foreseeable future. There's not really any signs of it slowing down. If anything, it's still accelerating. I think there's broad consensus on that. Although, of course, there's always naysayers who are like, it's all smoke and mirrors. And I'm like, whatever, you're not paying attention to reality. The main KPI that I pay attention to are better, faster, cheaper, and safer. And so what I mean by that is that once once AI and machines are better, faster, cheaper, safer than humans, um, it would it's an economically inevitable that they will replace us. But it, especially if they're safer than us and, and achieve better outcomes, it might be an ethical imperative to replace humans with machines. Um, another assumption is that the frontier of automation will subsume uh, most human capacity relatively soon, um, as predicted by that IMF report that I just did a video on. And then finally, permanent unemployment begins to rise um, and shows no sign of slowing down. So those are kind of the core assumptions that I'm making uh, about what the future looks like. So if all that's true, now what? What happens next? How do we get from here to zero employment? How do we get from here to UBI and beyond and whatever comes next? How do we get to full post-labor economics? So here's my current thoughts. First, I think that it will go through four phases and we're in phase one right now. So phase one is early victims. So the first victims are creatives. So writers and image generators. And so here's, here's a rule of thumb that my wife uh, somewhat cynically uh, believes, but it seems like it's proving to be true. And she says that the default value of creativity under capitalism is zero. Meaning if you can produce some creative work for free, people will consume it for free. And if they can get away without paying you, they will get away without paying you. Um, so creatives are the first out the door. Um, and this is, I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's like an uncontested statement, especially when you look at, um, you know, the, all the fighting over um, image generation and the, the Hollywood Writers Guild and all that kind of fun stuff. It's like, okay, like the writing's on the wall there. The next uh, set of victims are going to be back office workers, such as like clerical and administrative workers. Um, they're already kind of being automated away, but you still kind of need humans in the loop to provide oversight. And the primary rule of thumb here is that forgivable and unregulated jobs are the most vulnerable. And so what forgivable means is that a forgivable job is one where mistakes are okay, where there's no lives on the line. Uh, it's not going to hurt the bottom line if you make small mistakes, which is why creativity um, is one of the first things to go is because it is messy by nature. Uh, likewise, just processing paperwork, the business isn't going to grind to a halt if a back office AI needs a little bit of extra oversight or double checks because a lot of those things have double checks and cross checking in the workflows already because humans are prone to make mistakes. Why? Because that kind of work is tedious and mind numbing and you, you need to have a series of checks anyways. But none of them are regulated. 
Uh, and so a regulated job or a regulated industry is one where you need certification or education or accreditation in order to perform that job or or the work product needs to be inspected and improved, such as by the FDA or, you know, Medical Board of Advisors or whatever. So any any jobs that are forgivable and unregulated, those are going to be the first to go just because that is the economic low hanging fruit. And uh, so before we get to phase two, I want to reiterate the automation paradox. So I think the I, I think the, the best definition of the automation paradox, and if there's a better term for this, please let me know in the comments. Um, I think there is a better term, but I couldn't find it. Uh, but basically, the productivity of employees who use AI tools are going to continue to rise up until the very moment that another AI tool or automation tool can just fully replace the, 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 the human. And so like, as you're doing more and more uh, of your job with AI, eventually you just aren't needed because then um, a, a, an employee proxy uses the tools for you and then human productivity drops to zero and you get laid off while the machine takes over your job. So productivity continues to climb and you're feeling great, but then that next innovation, you know, GPT-5 drops or Gemini 2 or whatever, you know, the next model drops and that pushes the, the frontier of automation just past the finish line and suddenly your job is no longer, uh, no longer requires you. And so the transition from phase one to phase two is people are going to feel it when the frontier of automation subsumes their entire set of tasks that they can do. And one thing that I want to point out is that the automation, uh, the frontier of automation is by and large about cognitive labor. But when you look at the level of performance that the Tesla bot did, the level of manual dexterity that it demonstrated, and that was after like less than a year of development or just over a year of development, the frontier of automation is also going to include uh, manual dexterous labor and skilled physical labor in environments that we thought that only humans could do. So that's coming fast. And of course, Tesla is not the only one working on humanoid robots. There are lots and lots of other ones. So 2024, we're going to see a huge ramp up in the amount of physical labor that machines can do. Um, there is the, that article about uh, the Amazon robots that are expected to replace all Amazon workers and only cost $3 per hour to run. So it's coming. So that all leads to phase two, which I just kind of call the winding down phase. And so the winding down phase is... Uh, it's winding down for us, the employees, the humans. It's it, This is when the uh, investors are going to be super excited. Like the stock market is going to be going crazy, I think. And lots of investors are going to be super excited. And this is also where you're going to see the capitalist class is going to be even more detached from the reality that most human, most like people are facing because they're going to be like, profits have never been higher. We're great. Like go faster. And so all the accelerationists are going to be like, keep going faster, buy stocks, you know, stonks up and to the right. Um, meanwhile, more and more people are going to be laid off. So, but this video is more about your experience and how do we get to a better future rather than what's good for the few uh, in the ownership class. So, uh, Shorter weeks have been proposed for a while, and actually some uh, have started experimenting with it. I think it was, was it Ferrari or Lamborghini just implemented a universal four-day work week or something like that? Um, and then there's been experiments around the world with four-day work weeks, and some people are even proposing three-day work weeks now. So part of this winding down phase, uh, the reason that I bring up uh, the shorter work weeks is because as more and more automation tools take parts of your job, you're going to be needed at the office less. But this also is a really good opportunity for people to um, have more time to like adapt to life after work. Because imagine if your work week shortens to four days a week and then three days a week, and suddenly you, you find yourself with more and more free time, you're going to find a way to fill that time. You're going to find new hobbies. You're going to find new meaning. And you're going to have a gentle transition away from, you know, the, the 40 to 80 hour a week grind. And so then you'll have this gentle taper where it's like, okay, now we go to a 30 hour work week, then 20, then 15, then 10. And then by the time you're at a 10 hour work week, you're, you're mostly out the door. Uh, and so that's kind of what I, what I hope we see. Um, for companies that can, I think it would be wise for companies to adopt that trajectory. And let me tell you why. Um, because this gives companies an opportunity and incentive to also begin implementing that, that, that automation. 
So imagine you're a CEO of a mid-sized company and you see the writing on the wall and, you know, your employees are like, we need to keep our jobs, blah, blah, blah. And of course, like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways to approach that. But imagine that you say, okay, you keep your salary, but let's go down to a four hour uh, work week. And the expectation then is you're using AI um, to, to maintain the level of productivity. And then once, you know, everyone gets comfortable with that, maybe in a year or two, then you go down to a three day work week and then you go down, you know, even further. And by then, like, we'll, we'll know more because it's possible that the frontier of automation will stall, but it might not. And another recommendation that I have for businesses, um, to participate ethically in transitioning to this is do not like get rid of the, the back to office mandates, like stop trying to go back to the status quo. Remote work is amazing. A remote work allows people to move to economically more feasible areas. And so like uh, part of part of the transition to post labor economics means that we're not going to have to live in urban centers just to be close to work. And so for me, in the last couple of weeks, I just moved uh, an hour away from where I used to live because it's like, wait, I have no economic need to live near a major city anymore. And I don't want to live near a major city because it's loud and it stinks and the people are all um, asshats because they're all <laughs> imported from San Francisco. And I got to say, like drivers from San Francisco, you guys are obvious and you're awful drivers, especially in the rain. Um, and you go too fast and you tailgate too much. Um, <laughs> this is a known, this is a known thing. Anyways, so I moved out to the country, back to my roots where cost of living is lower. The pace of life is better. And we were like instantly happier. Um, and like, I want that for everyone. And because we're, because we're capable of remote work right now, we should do more remote work. But this is also a way that companies can work on transitioning to post-labor economics. So phase three will be, um, as that ramps up, as the, sh as the work weeks get shorter and shorter, total unemployment or sorry, total employment plateaus. So total employment right now is still climbing, although it's climbing more slowly than uh, economists would like to see. So once you see total employment plateau, it'll be a nice, gentle, parabolic plateau. Um, that's when the establishment is going to start to panic because they're like, wait, we can't just grow forever. What's going to happen to jobs? And a lot of the old school traditionalists are going to be like, we need to get you know employment numbers up. Um, meanwhile, unemployment is going to continue to rise. And so right now in America, it's really low. I think it's still around 3%, maybe less, uh, maybe a little bit more. I think it's less than 4%. I don't think we're in the twos. That would be like, people would be going crazy if it was in the twos. Anyways, so however, as these layoffs continue, as the need for human labor continues to rise, we should expect total employment to plateau and unemployment to start to rise. Once you see those, you, you'll see NEETS, so N-E-E-T, um, that is not in education, employment, or training. Um, once that rises and people see that people are just not getting back to work, um, the acknowledgement by the establishment of this new economic paradigm will emerge and you'll start to see some people you know, saying publicly that we need something new. We need something else. Um, they might not use the term post-labor economics. I'm trying to lay the groundwork with that with all of my work. Um, but certainly, I think that people are paying attention. Um, so one of the key milestones to pay attention to so that you know that we're in phase three is that politicians and the chairman of the Federal Reserve and you know mainstream media talking heads all start you know acknowledging this fact. They say, where where do we go from here? We need a new economic paradigm. There, you're going to hear terms like labor markets and you know uh, paradigm shifts and that sort of stuff. When you start to hear that um, coming from more mainstream sources, um, you'll know that we are very much in phase three. They're going to be talking about social safety nets, unemployment benefits, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, after that trend, it, so if that trend is persistent and increases, because again, we're we are making a lot of assumptions. Um, it's the, the biggest risk here is that the frontier of automation stalls for whatever reason. Um, but if it doesn't stall, it's full steam ahead. So phase four is once we get to the, the place of full and true post-labor economics. And so the, the, this phase of full and true post-labor economics is when cities, states, and federal governments all reconcile with the new economic reality that we are in. 
you're going to start to see more talk about UBI being necessary or UBS, so Universal Basic Services. And so um, Universal Basic Services, this is going to be stuff that like is kind of baseline, like utilities, power, water, internet, phone service, that kind of stuff that's more or less equal. Um, you probably won't see Universal Basic Services in the form of housing, at least not for most people. Um, and there's a good reason for that, and it's capital C communism, which I'll talk about in just a minute, because we actually really want to avoid full-on communism or socialism. And I think you'll be surprised by the solutions that I have to propose. But the hardest part about this is not the technical solutions. The hardest part about this is the narratives, is the human aspect. And even Sam Altman said this um, in his Time Magazine CEO of the Year interview. Um, I don't remember the exact question that he was asked, but it was like, he was asked like, how do we solve the new social paradigms? And Sam Altman's like, that's way harder than AGI. <laughs> and that's almost identical to something that I have been saying for a while, uh, which is that like creating cognitive architectures is easy compared to the human component. So the old social contract is, uh, this is the simplest way that I could say it. The, the current social contract is the government mediates the relationship between labor and business. That's it. That is the role of government. Um, a century ago, the role of government was a little bit bigger. It was the role of government saw itself as the caretaker of citizens. But because of neoliberalism, the role of government has contracted to say the government mediates the relationship between labor and business. But if labor is going away, hence post-labor economics, what is the role of government? And so we need to, I'm not saying expand the role of government, but it's certainly going to need to pivot or transition. And so the new social contract, I have yet to find a good way of wording it, but the current wording is government mediates the relationship between citizens and business or maybe citizens and owners. I'm not sure. Anyways, we got to figure that out. I'm not going to figure it out on my own. This has got to be part of a truly collective democratic conversation. Um, but anyway, so what does that look like? All right, real quick plug for my Patreon. So one thing that I wanted to say is that I have done some experimentation and uh, integrated some feedback from the audience, uh, from my supporters, and I have simplified my Patreon so that now it is one tier. It is the universal access tier, one size uh, fits all. And at this tier, you get pretty much everything. Um, and the primary things that you get are the uh, access to the exclusive community, the exclusive Discord community, as well as a monthly live stream Q&A that I've moved over to Zoom webinar. So we have a very nice, clean, professional uh, format with uh, good Q&A polls and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, real quick uh, plug for my Patreon. Now right back to the show. And so so here's where I, I talk about the, the biggest problem. So even if you can have the role of government expand and maybe, you know, like let's just do a quick thought experiment. You go backwards in time and you say that the role of government is to take care of the citizens. So that was embedded liberalism. We got, we get, we did away with that and we moved to neoliberalism. If you go back to embedded liberalism and you say, okay, well, the government provides guaranteed income and guaranteed services and a lot's housing and that sort of stuff, that is just straight up capital C communism, um, which you don't want to give the government that much power. Uh, and there's good reasons that you don't want to give the government that much power because you need checks and balances. You need a balance of power between multiple stakeholders so that you have this dynamic tension. There's a lot of game theory behind it. There's a lot of economic theory behind it. But TLDR, capital C communism is bad. Uh, you know, central management is bad. Nobody wants that. I mean, a few people want that, but by and large, nobody really wants that. So, but if if we lose economic agency by losing labor power, how do we have economic agency in the future? If there's no labor market, if we can't, if we don't have a, a way of participating, then to me, it's like the the solution became obvious. We need to be we all need to be part owners. And so this is where I realized that a major major component of the new social contract is decentralized ownership. Uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks all at once. I think I woke up one morning and I was just like, duh, like this solution has been staring us in the face. Um, so decentralized ownership, and I don't mean collective ownership. I don't mean like, you know, the, the, the nation, like nationalized resources. That's not what I mean at all. What I mean is decentralized private ownership because, and in some cases, maybe municipal ownership. 
Um, but DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, that might be one path forward. Uh, public trusts might be another path forward. Local co-ops like farms, utilities, and other basic goods and services could all be locally owned, communally owned. Because the thing is, is organizing an entire economy from the top down at a national level, not necessarily good. But if all the stakeholders who consume particular goods and services are also owners of those uh, of, of those industries that provide those goods and services, you're going to get the benefit of local management, local expertise, better communication, and those sorts of things. So this leads me to an idea that I had called SwarmDAO. So for the SwarmDAO idea, I wanted to... Uh, basically I just had this like stroke of inspiration one night and I like jumped out of bed and started talking to the autonomous AI, uh, community, community leadership. And I said, guys, I think I figured it out. And I don't even remember what led to this particular, uh, revelation, but I was just like, why don't we use a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization to steer the swarm? Because in the work that we've been doing with um, like the Haas project, the HAAS, the Hierarchical Autonomous Agent Swarm, it was like, okay, we have the Supreme Oversight Board, which is, you know, a set of agents that is there to do, you know, ethical steering and mission-based steering. Um, but people are kind of lost when it's like, okay, well, fully autonomous for what? Like still, like even if you give it a mission, who gives it the mission? And then it occurred to me, I was like, people give it the mission, like, if we're trying to transition away from uh, current technology or, or current economic paradigms and technology, then like we use a DAO or some kind of decentralized uh, decision-making framework in order to steer the swarms. And so this is not like an official, like fully launched thing that I'm doing. Um, it's just an idea that I'm putting out there because I honestly don't have the time or energy to run any more projects or anything, but I can help coordinate <laughs> Um, so the link to join the, um, the, the public discord community for, uh, agent swarms and that stuff should be in the description or comments. So yeah, jump on over and take a look at that. Um, if you're interested in, uh, participating also connect with me on LinkedIn, if you're interested in, uh, just chatting about, uh, this kind of stuff, but, um, my dance card is really full. I have more than 20 interviews scheduled over the next month. Um, <laughs> for my systems thinking, uh, uh, channel. So quick plug for my systems thinking channel used to be my neurospicy channel, but now it's systems thinking with David Shapiro. All right. So, so one thing to keep in mind about the swarm DAO thing is that it is highly experimental, highly speculative. Um, so, but it's just one idea. Um, and I think, I think it's a meritorious experiment. I think that it should be done. Um, now one of the biggest problems with all this though, is the expertise gap. Not everyone is an expert manager or qualified to run a farm or qualified to do half of the things that we would need to do. Like, I don't know how to run a power company and I should not be put in charge of a power company, even if I am part owner of a local power company. But then like the solution seemed kind of self-evident to me because if AI is able to dislocate that job, then AI is able to do that job, which means that we can just, instead of hiring a human to do the job, we hire the AI that replaced the human to do the job and that we use the DAO to coordinate it all. So this is actually pretty similar to a, um, to an interview that I did a company called Tau, T-A-U. Um, so I don't know that their approach is the correct way, but I think that they're on the right track. So you, uh, the interview is way deep in my backlog. So go look that up if you want. Um, but it's tau.net, so tau.net if you want to check out their technology. Um, anyways, so, but the point remains, if AI is smart enough to take the plant manager's job, if AI is smart enough to take the water treatment manager's job, if AI is smart enough to take the nuclear engineer's job, then AI is smart enough to just run these things for us on our behalf. And then all we need is an economic stake in these things. Um, either via blockchain technology, DAO, some kind of decentralized ownership model. We don't even necessarily need technology um, to do this. Like there are some existing, you know, uh, co-op models that exist today um, in terms of corporate governance. And I actually, I'm going to talk to some of my uh, corporate attorney friends about this because it's like, this seems eminently doable. But if once AI gets to that point, it's like a self-solving problem. So I'm pretty excited about that. Now, um, as we get down to kind of the last half of the video or so, um, I want to talk some about some more uh, concepts, some more components 
of what I see as the social contract solution. So the new social contract um, is uh, partly decentralized ownership, partly redistribution such as UBI, UBS, you know, changing the role of government. But I've also been fascinated by this concept of stakeholder capitalism. So I know a lot of you like immediately cringed when I said that. And for those that didn't, let me explain why. And it's kind of sus. I'm not going to lie. Like, let me tell you why this, why I'm kind of surprised at myself for coming around to this. So stakeholder capitalism, its biggest exponent is Larry Fink, who is the, I think the CEO or founder or both of BlackRock. So BlackRock is the, is the biggest asset management company in the world. I think they have like 7 trillion AUM assets under management, maybe more than that. I don't know, but it's like measured in the trillions. Um, and so he's been pushing uh, stakeholder capitalism for a while. It's ultra unpopular with the business traditionalists. Um, it's responsible for stuff like ESG, which is often blamed for all the wokeness in places like Disney. And when you look at the at the performance of the MCU um, after Disney took full ownership and you know went full capitalist on it, like yeah, they're not doing great. <laughs> um, so, but the idea is simple. So current, the current economic paradigm is shareholder uh, value or shareholder capitalism. So shareholder capitalism just says your, your responsibility, your mission is to maximize the value for shareholders. And so if you're maximizing the value for shareholders, it's who owns the stock. You want to you you know, get the stock price up and to the right. You want to generate those dividends. Um, and that's it. Stakeholder capitalism by contrast, is you're trying to maximize the value for all stakeholders. That includes customers, employees, vendors, the environment, and even bystanders, even people who are not participating in your business, in the production and distribution of those goods and services. So like some of you might say, well, that's just, that's just communism under another name. And it's like, yeah, kind of. Um, it's not communism with a capital C. It's not like Soviet red communism. It's like communism light for the capitalists, for the neoliberals. But what I want to challenge you with is what if stakeholder capitalism is part of the new social contract? Because that's kind of what we all want, right? Like in principle, and now I will be the first one to say that in that principle versus practice can be very different. Um, don't get me started about DEI and autism. But in principle, stakeholder capitalism on paper looks like kind of what we want, where uh where Everyone, including the environment, is considered a stakeholder in the economic engines of productivity of goods and services. So what if we can implement this correctly with decentralized ownership and new technologies to support those, such as blockchain, such as DAO, maybe crypto, I don't know, but it's, those are all kind of in the same category. So just what if, I, like I said, principle versus practice, very different things, but I think that these are some experiments that are worth doing. So as we uh, wind down uh, the last part of this video, I wanted to actually come up with some, some very specific policy recommended recommendations at the city, state, and federal level. So this is just to get the, get the gears turning, to prime the pump, because as I was researching this video, as I was preparing to make it, I actually started realizing like there's actually some good ideas about how we can pivot to post-labor economics, what that path looks like. So first and foremost, let's start at the city level, the local municipality. So towns, villages, cities, uh, basically every municipality everywhere can begin preparing for an urban exodus. As I mentioned earlier in the video, um, I myself left a, an urban center because I just didn't want to be there anymore and I had no physical need to be there. So I expatriated to um, a much, small, much, much smaller town with a different pace of life and different vibe. Um, and I am like in, it was instant. I was instantly happier. Um, and like, I just, I can't, I, I, I want that experience for everyone. I, for anyone who is stuck in the suburbs and stuck commuting, I, I wish that everyone who is stuck in that situation to have that experience that I just had of leaving the city and going to like live in the town of your dreams and just getting that instant change of like quality of life like, man, I cannot tell you. And so like, oh boy, like do it if you can. <laughs> um, so, but, but basically not only is this good for your mental health and your, it's good for your financial health because you move to a, a place with a lower cost of living. This allows for everyone to make economic decisions 
based on efficiency and preferred lifestyle changes, which that's going to pay dividends in the long run. Um, and that is going to be part of the solution because part of degrowth, part of circular economies is becoming more economically efficient, which has com uh, compounding uh, net effects. UBS, so universal basic services, such as power, water, internet, those sorts of things, those are best to be organized and operated locally, which cities can play a huge part in. So that might mean that, that trash pickup becomes free. That might mean that electricity becomes free, at least within reason. Uh, water becomes free, those sorts of things. Because if cities can figure out how to provide those services for free, or, you know, for free at, at consumption, obviously everything has an energetic and material cost. But if they can provide it as a given service, just kind of like how schools are provided as a service, um, then that could make cities very attractive to this urban exodus. Um, and so then they attract more people, they could attract more businesses, and so on and so forth. Uh, circular economies can also be best implemented at the local level. So if you're not familiar with the concept of circular economies, the idea is, that, and I'm, I've actually got a video um, that I'm working on to explore this in greater detail, but the idea is that you reduce waste. Um, you you create more local feedback loops of, of energetic material um, and energy and material uses. You make sure that all all outputs, all waste output um, waste output products have a destination to go. So you reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, you know the three R's that we've had forever. But you basically design the local economy around these cyclical uses of materials, um, and also to make uh, make the most efficient use of waste energy as well. These are best implemented locally. Farm to table is an example of of one component of a circular economy. Um, the full life cycle, life cycle of garbage, soil, cardboard, plastics. These are all things that are best managed locally. So cities actually have probably the biggest role to play in preparing for post-labor economics. If there's any mayors or city officials in my audience, please reach out to me. I want to talk to you. Um, I want to get your perspective and also like help out if I can. I'm up to my eyeballs in projects, so I probably can't help out, but I want to hear from you. So next up is state policies. So state policies are a little bit more abstract, but um, one helpful uh, audience member reached out and, and pointed out to me that Vermont actually is, I think, the, maybe the first or at least the only, it's the first or the only state that allows for legal uh, acknowledgement of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. I'm not a corporate attorney, so I don't know whether or not that's true. I haven't looked into it, but it wouldn't surprise me because Vermont is really progressive. That's where Bernie Sanders came from, I think. So... Um, but states have a role to play by paving the way for acknowledgement and allowing um, decentralized ownership models. So maybe Vermont is the place to go to try SwarmDAO, to try some of these, these um, new co-ops where if you have locally owned um, and managed goods and services, and, and whether they're universal basic services or even for-profit companies or you know public trust, land co-ops, whatever, um, that's the biggest role that I think states have to play in paving the way for post-labor economics. Because if states allow for decentralized ownership and they create legal and regulatory and economic frameworks, um, and, you know, like in their state chamber of commerce or, you know, the county chambers of commerce, if they are paying attention to this and they start setting up those experiments, then it can be a hopefully a very smooth transition from shareholder capitalism to true stakeholder capitalism with decentralized ownership. Um, some UBI and redistribution and UBS should happen at the state level as well. Again, schools are a prime example. Um, maybe some relocation and redistribution, uh, sorry, resettlement assistance. So basically um, incentivizing people to leave expensive uh, carbon intensive, uh, you know, urban centers and move out to the suburbs and move out to the more rural life, um, you know, but basically helping helping cities to um, make that transition as well would be within the interest and purview of states, um, state congresses, state legislature, that sort of sort of thing. And then finally, at the federal level. So the federal level, this new social contract has to include all citizens. So by virtue of that, this new social contract has to be negotiated in part with the help of the president of the United States and the Congress. And then this, of course, this, this applies to the federal level of um, all nations, France, Germany, blah, 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 EU as well. 
Um, now one thing, so I just want to address this real quick. Many people say like, Dave, you don't talk about other countries as much. That's because I don't live in other countries and I'm not as familiar with them. Um, I would love to, uh, stay in another country. Like honestly, if I could get an EU passport or at least, you know, a long-term visa or something, I would love to live in Greece, in France, in Spain, in Italy, even in the Rhine and Germany. Um, but I'm just not as familiar with other countries. Um, and also, like, I am very aware that I have a very Western-centric view. Why? Because I grew up in the West. Um, anyways, so we do have two pre two precedents for presidents um, leading the charge in negotiating new social contracts, both of whom were Roosevelt's, um, at least the two examples I'm going to use. So there was Teddy Roosevelt with the Square Deal. So Teddy Roosevelt is famous for the trust-busting that he did. And so the square deal was trying to renegotiate the relationship between, um, the, you know, the barons, the, the monopolies and everyone else. And then Franklin Roosevelt's new deal was, uh, in some respects bigger, um, and kind of more of a transition to like, Hey, let's, let's make things a little bit better. Um, so did I say fair deal or new deal? Franklin Roosevelt's new deal. And so now we need what I call the fair deal, which is like, the fair deal is the new social contract that has decentralized ownership and stakeholder capitalism at its heart. Anyways, these, these negotiations will need to happen at a national level. And, and when I say federal level, I don't mean just like the federal government. I mean like all, all citizens, all voters, um, all stakeholders will need to be participating in this negotiation. And finally, you might be wondering, okay, timelines, when is all this going to happen? Uh, I'm not going to say that it's anyone's guess because we're not really guessing anymore. There have been multiple sources and, and some of these with, with a lot of vested interest um, in getting this right. And so the two primary sources that I pay attention to right now, and of course there are plenty out there, there are more, more sources out there, but these are kind of the two more credible sources. Um, one is the IMF. So you probably saw my other recent video about the IMF report predicting five to 20 years um, to have AGI kind of dislocate all jobs. Um, and then the other one is Goldman Sachs, which if I remember correctly, Goldman Sachs predicted 2027 to 2028 is when we start to see unemployment, uh, permanent unemployment rising sharply. So that's that dovetails nicely with the five-year timeline. So basically kind of what I think is we're going to see is Within the next five years, we're going to see a major transition to this new paradigm. I'm not. I'm not saying that you know uh, we're going to be at zero percent employment in five years. But what I what I am saying is that much of what I've discussed in this video will be, um, if not fully implemented, then I think that the the, the reality will have set in. And so, uh, basically, kind of the way that I the way that I word it is. Um, we should expect a gradual transition of the frontier of automation, basically starting yesterday, starting 2023. Um, I think history will, will record 2023 as kind of the last normal year. 2024, we'll see uh, kind of the, the, the beginning of a transition from an early adopter phase to an early majority phase. So basically, adoption of any new technology follows a bell curve. And so we are, you know, before now, it was in the, the cutting edge, you know, the, the, the people that are just at the, at the front, at the leading edge of everything. We're in the very, very early adopters phase. And I think 2024, we will see this is going to be the pivot to the early majority. Um, and so there's going to be laggards. There's going to be industries that um, aren't going to benefit a little bit less from AI. There's going to be regulatory resistance. There's going to be status quo resistance. So as I've mentioned in other videos, um, you better believe that doctors, lawyers, and politicians are going to resist being replaced, as any human would. You know, we have a preference for the status quo, but eventually the economic pressure is going to undercut and kind of force a change. Now, hopefully they don't sabotage the change, as we saw with the Hollywood uh, the Writers Guild. They're just basically sabotaging the, the change um, in, in the most conventional classical sense of the word sabotage, um, basically like kind of throwing their shoes into the, into the wheel work to try and gum it up and slow it down, even though the change is inevitable. So thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Let me know if you like the new format, like subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the drill cheers.